Well, good morning to you guys. Man, it is really good to be able to just get together and to be able to lift up prayers together for Pastor Bob. I'm so encouraged. Oh, we don't even, <laughs> we're falling apart already up here. Um, I, uh, I really have been just really encouraged by everybody's response in prayer and uh, just really appreciative of you all for that. Now, um, you're going to have to think back a little ways, and uh, you probably have to be about over 21 years old to even know what I'm talking about. But how many of you guys, show of hands, remember Blockbuster? Yes. Okay. Good. Good. Uh, I see some of, the, some of the young people are like, what are you talking about? And uh, the, the thing about Blockbuster is uh, when, when my wife were early on dating, this is uh, 11, 12 years ago, we didn't have a lot of money. So a big date night out for us was spending a dollar fifty. Yeah, I know. I was a stud back then. <laughs> um, so, um, so yeah, a crazy night out for us was was renting a movie. And you know, when we go to Blockbuster, really we just kind of peruse around. My wife Sarah would want to get a romantic comedy or a Hallmark movie, which are the worst, so predictable. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I know a lot of you guys love it, and that's good for you, but not for me. And then I always was pretty predictable, too. I wanted to get some action movie. Somebody's blowing up something, like Will Smith is killing the aliens, Independence Day, something like that. It's got to be, it's got to be that. And so, like every good couple, what we'd do is we'd compromise on something we both didn't like, you know? So that's what we do. And I remember, though, Blockbuster eventually came to just an end. You know, Netflix came about. At first, it was the mail-in DVDs and then the streaming service. And uh, really, Blockbuster, at, at its heyday, had 89,000 employees and now is no longer. The question we have for today is, is the church really just headed on the same trajectory that Blockbuster was? Is it really, at the end of the day, just going to become extinct? Like, what does church look like in a post-COVID world? Why do we even need church? Can't you just get that in your local book club or at your YMCA? What are we doing? What does this look like? I think it's a question that's really relevant to us in this season. And for us to find that answer, today we're going to go to an ancient letter written by a man named Paul who wrote much of the New Testament of the Bible. And uh, Paul is an interesting person. He was somebody who, who really hated Christians early on and had a whole transformation experience himself where he came to faith and then became one of the prominent leaders of the early church. And as he's writing this letter, he is writing it likely from jail, and he hears a report of what's happening at a, a, a church in a town called Colossae. That's where we get the name of the book of Colossians. And he's also writing to another nearby church that's about 11 miles down the road in a town called Laodicea. So let's open up to Colossians chapter 2. Here is what it says. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow, hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Paul shares his heart and his wisdom for us right here in answering the question, why church? I, I like how he starts the letter when he says, I am contend I want you to know how hard I am contending for you. What we just did as a church together and throughout this week and even here this morning was contend for Pastor Bob. 
We were contending in prayer. And today, as we celebrate our Vision Sunday, if you want to know the vision of our church, we are going to be a church that is dependent on prayer, that believes in the work of God. He is still active and moving in our hearts. If you believe that, this would be a good time to say amen. And, you know, the the thing I I love, you can see his heart is bleeding through for his people. He cares deeply. And here's the thing about the church. The church is a place where we contend for one another. And the church is a place to be encouraged in heart and united in love. Just as verse 2 says, the church is a place to be encouraged in heart and united in love. Now, Now, what does this mean? Before we get into that, I just, I want to be honest with you for a moment. I think for, for me this week, it, it was a very challenging emotional week for me in, in seeing Pastor Bob go through what he was going through in the hospital and not sure where things are going to go. It just, my, my heart was, was bleeding and contending for my brother, for my leader. And, uh, you know, my mind kept feeling like it was jumbled. It was hard to focus and in the midst of some increased responsibilities. But what I can tell you is this, that in the midst of all of that, I was so encouraged in heart. And the reason for that is just what Ben was sharing is, man, there was this outpouring of love from our church family. People that I haven't seen or talked to in over a year were just like, we are pleading for for pastor. Uh, We are really praying, contending. You know what? That really encouraged my heart because I think for for us sometimes, encouragement can be hard to find. But I, I really believe that encouragement is something that we need. Just like we need water, I think we need encouragement. There's this minister, his name is Michael Easley. He says it this way, every person is insecure and under-encouraged. Every person is insecure and under-encouraged. I think, I wonder what would happen if we operated like that as we are going through our days with people, seeing people in that light. Well, how would that affect our language towards others? Why do we need the church? Because we need to be encouraging each other's hearts up together. That is when the church is at its best, when we pray for each other, when we share our struggles together. And the church also is needed because we are needed to be united in love. United in love. Now, this year was a year of so many divisions. I know you could think of them already. But I even think of things like um, how you handle uh, a mask and, or, or how, how often you see people in person or not. or how like There's so many different crazy things we've had to navigate over the last year. And we've all recognized all those tensions. But those tensions have actually resulted in people saying, I'm no longer going to be friends with you because of the way that you're handling this. Yet another division that divides us. And I don't know if you uh, watched the news at all last year. There was this, um, this little thing, what, the political election. There was like a couple disagreements along the way. I don't know. I'm not sure if you saw it. <laughs> okay. No, we were so divided as a country over all the politics. And then on top of that, all the racial tensions. So we've got people saying like, I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. I can't associate. Or um, I'm white and I'm black. We, it's not even that we, we see the world different. We experience the world so different. So we've got all these, these divisions among us. So when Paul says united in love, what in the world does that mean when, we, when everything seems so divided? Well, I'll tell you this. I, I think that for, for unity, it, is, it does not mean uniformity. It does not mean that we have to see and agree on every single thing. What unity really means is that we are united by Jesus. He is the one who unites us. He is united by love. The ultimate expression of love is Jesus. And so maybe we're not going to see eye to eye on every single issue, but we as a church are going to be not focused on what draws us apart, but what draws us together. And what draws us together is Jesus. If you believe it, would you say amen? We are united in love. Now, Part of Paul's main concern as he is writing this section of his letter is he is really concerned that 
that um, the, the church is going to get deceived by, by really well-crafted arguments. And what Paul isn't suggesting is that you shouldn't use your brain, but he is concerned that people are, are really going to be, uh, yeah, just, just fooled by what's out there. And honestly, I even see this today. It's like, whether it's like in a, in a compelling documentary or a, um, you know, even like your social media feed, like they can make these really compelling arguments, but oftentimes it isn't the full picture. Like it's got a clear agenda attached to it. And there's a time and a place for, for all of those things and, and for people to make arguments outside of the church and things like that. But, but I, I wonder if today, if there aren't some of us who are getting sucked into some really fine sounding arguments that Paul is really asking us to guard against. And he's got a much better vision than you and I getting deceived by the messages of the world. He says this in verse number six. Just then, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith. The church is a place for us to chase after the truth about God. The church is a place where we run after the truth of God. We're, we're not a people, we're not a people who are stagnant, who are staying still. No, we are rooted in who God is and then built up by each other. And I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a church that's just filled with apathy. You know, the, the thing of it is, you and I, we're not just consumers, we're contributors of church. Like you are the culture setters of Calvary Assembly. You get to affect who we become. And I think this is, is so important for us to recognize that we are actually the ones who get to contribute to the culture of this place. You know, uh, part of the main message of the whole book of Colossians, if I were to summarize the, the main purpose of it, it's, it's this, it's that, it's the supremacy of Christ. It means this. It means that Jesus is above everything. Jesus is number one. And so part of uh, Paul's call to the whole church at large is to say the number one pursuit of our hearts and of our lives should be Jesus. Don't get deceived by all these other things. The number one pursuit has got to be Jesus. That's what he's calling us to. And if you're wondering what the vision of Calvary Assembly is, it is the supremacy of of Christ. If you believe it, would you say amen? amen? You know, there's, so there's, there's the vision of the whole church, meaning, and by church, I mean all followers of Jesus across the world. But there also is given to us as a local church, a, a specific vision that God has for us together. And the vision of Calvary Assembly is a safe place to find faith, friends, and your future. Check this out from the passage, talking about faith. It's, it says this, so that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, for I am delighted to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Paul's vision for the church is that we would have deep faith to come to know and understand just how mysterious God is, but just how much he has shown of himself as well. And the church is a place for us to actually not check our brains at the door, but to be able to actually engage in really hard questions together, to wrestle through them, sometimes even argue through them, but to do it united in love. I like this in verse number two, Paul says, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. Again, Paul's vision for the church is that we would be encouraged and united in love. We are friendships. We are forming relationships. And these relationships have a lot of differences. We don't look the same. We don't sound the same. We got different ages. We got different, all of that, all sorts of differences. But we are together encouraged in heart and united in love. And he says this in verse number six in talking about our futures. So then, 
Just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives rooted in him. Continue means forward motion, going forward towards the future. We are not stagnant. We are the church. We get to, we start by building our roots down deep into the ground, our foundation in Jesus. And then we build each other up together. We cannot do this alone. As Pastor Bob says, there is no Lone Ranger spirituality. It doesn't exist. You, you can't grow and become your full potential on your own. We need each other encouraged and united in love. Now, <clears throat> Calvary Assembly, we have our own unique vision. And what I want you to know is that our methods have changed drastically, but our mission has not changed. I want to take a, a, a couple of minutes to, to think back and celebrate what God has done in 2020 and look forward to the future because, you know, 2020 was a ridiculous year and I know it was a really hard year and has continued on to be hard for many of us here. But God has also done some really great things, and I want to take um, some time to be able to, to think about that and even to think about how we've been able to accomplish our vision together. So the first and, and most uh, physically obvious is this new building that we've been able to enjoy. And I really thank God that we're able to have this new space. I want you to think about this. <clears throat> so as we were progressing through the pro progress of the building, we, we came to March and um, everything shut down. Our church was shut down for over 120 days um, for in-person gatherings. We pivoted to online church only. And it was through that time that we were able to actually finish our project much faster than we were anticipating, which was really, we were really grateful for. But um, when we launched this new space, and, and even now today, we're following all of the CDC guidelines and still sitting six feet apart and, and all of those things. When, when we first started, I got to be honest, there was a, some real disappointment from what I was dreaming of and hoping for, for many years. And that is that we would have a room that was packed, that was lifting up the name of Jesus. And we, we simply were not able to do that and to do that safely. And so um, there was some grief that came along with that. But I, I will be honest, when I, when I started to think about it, I started thinking, if we were to have as many people as we had, have had come back on a weekly basis, in order to fit in our old auditorium space, <clears throat> we would have had to have probably over five services every single weekend. Which means that not only would there be like really horrible times to try to come to church Sunday at three, like right during the middle of the Bills game, <laughs> um, <clears throat> there'd be nobody here then. But, you know, it wasn't just that, it was, it was that, when we, when we came back, we only had 30% of our volunteers available, which means that we'd be trying to do all these extra services without anybody to serve, which means we wouldn't have been able to do it, which means that there would have been people who wanted to come and hear the good news of Jesus and to grow in their faith, but they wouldn't have been able to. And so I'm really grateful to God that we've been able to have a space where we can grow. And we're just getting started with this space. At some point, things are going to open up and change, and we are going to be able to have many more of us back together in worshiping together again. And I really do look forward to that day. But the purpose of this building isn't just for this year and a bigger space so we can social distance. Our dream is that for the next 30 plus years, we would be investing into your lives, into your neighbor's lives, into your family's lives, into all of Chi Lai and Rochester and beyond, that we would be able to make Jesus famous and to have people's hearts transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so for us, this building is really just a launching point for us to be able to make a change and a difference in our world. But man, I am grateful that we have this expanded space for us to be able to do that. And I thank you so much for choosing. You know, you got to remember back to the original vision of this building. It wasn't that we didn't have a seat. So many of us didn't have a seat before. We had a seat. It was that we had no more seats, which means we couldn't continue to reach new people for Christ. And now, since the building has reopened, we've had many, 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 many new guests come and hear the good news. Not to mention all the expansion we've been able to do online. 
And I'm, I'm really grateful that our church um, was able to pivot and to go online for those, those first few days, but even to be providing um, online ministry now. We believe that it's real. And there's, there's pros and cons to online and physical and all those things. Like we, we recognize that. But I am so grateful that we can broadcast the good news of Jesus, that you can access it anytime, anywhere. I think that's a beautiful thing that I am really, really grateful for. And honestly, we have hundreds of people who are tuning in each and every week to watch and hear the good news. I even think about we, we've now been able to create a separate stream just for our deaf community where we have over 100 people engaging, primarily from Rochester, but we see people logging in from California and Ottawa and all over the place where um, we're able to make the good news of Jesus interpreted so that somebody who is deaf is able to, he to, to hear the good news as well. I am really, really grateful for that too. And then I think of our children's ministry. And man, I, um, <laughs> this is one that's really near and dear to my heart. I've got a seven-year-old and, and a four and a half-year-old. If I don't say the half, then I'm gonna get in trouble. So, um, so the, the thing that's been so great about this is we've, we've always previously used a, a really good curriculum that we purchased and adapted for our own purposes. But what we've been able to do is actually create our own curriculum and our own videos for if parents want to engage online, they can, or it also doubles for when we gather in person. And I'm really grateful um, that, like, my kids just can't wait to watch it. Like, they're, they're really actually excited about growing in their faith and watching this video, especially the takeaway with Jake. He's the goofy guy at the end. That's the best part. Um, but honestly, it's been, it's been so life-giving to be able to see that even our kids who haven't felt comfortable coming back yet in person have been able to grow their faith in that way, gospel-centered and engaging. I'm really grateful for that. Or I think about our teenagers, our, our second youth ministry. And the thing I love about our teenagers is they're very serious about growing in their faith and very serious about having fun. <laughs> That's my style. And the, the thing that is uh, so cool to me, I was actually even just texting a teenager last night and he was saying, I'm, I'm really excited about the rooted group that I'm in because I'm excited to do the fasting. I was like, well, you're crazy, <laughs> is the actual thing I said to him, you know, like a good pastor would. Um, and he said, no, you know what? I'm, I'm really excited about growing on my dependence on God. I, I love the earnestness of the faith. And our, our teens made all sorts of pivots as well. They were doing Instagram Live and started a YouTube channel and did all of that. And now they meet every other week. In fact, there's so many teenagers here that they can't fit in the new renovated space we made for them in the lower level. They actually have to meet in here Good problems. I'm good with good problems. So we've got our teens growing. And then I think about our college students. And man, our college ministry has been able to grow in this time as well. I think that's crazy because all the reports I see is that college is a time where kids walk away from the faith and they walk away from Jesus. The thing that we've just been talking about to be rooted in faith and to, to grow up in the teachings that you have had. And honestly, I'm so grateful that hasn't been the experience for so many college students here. I am grateful to God for that. And then I think about our young professionals group. They, they've tripled in size since COVID. Like, where, where are y'all coming from? <laughs> it's great. I, I'm so grateful for the work that God is doing in their small groups as well as they continue to gather together. And then I think about our young families. And, and as I said, we've been really trying to invest in the children to help raise and grow them up. But this, this is my demographic. Is it's been a really challenging year for young families, trying to figure out remote school and, and all the other headaches that have come along um, with COVID. But for us, we are committed to doing anything and everything we can to help raise up and train up your faith. And maybe for our young families, they're, they're not able to um, come back in person yet. So maybe they're listening to a podcast on Monday morning because they tried the Sunday morning thing and their kids were crawling all over and it wasn't working. I, I, there's a whole variety of ways that our young families are engaging. And we're really grateful that and committed to you all. And then I think of um, our adults. So many of them have, uh, have, so many of you have joined our rooted groups. And I'm really excited for the fruit that is going to come out of that. Over 200 people have signed up for small groups. I mean, that's amazing to me. 
I'm really grateful for the fruit that's going to come there. And I think about our senior ministry as well, our Young at Heart. And we had a challenging year for Young at Heart with some real losses that happened that were really hard. And we weren't able to meet for a year. It's the most vulnerable of our community. And, but I will say this, I, I was so grateful. Just a few weeks ago, we gathered in this space and we were able to worship together and we were able to uh, hear of each other's stories of how God had been working over the last year. And I was grateful for the stories that God is still at work in our seniors ministry. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you can clap. I mean, I'm good with that. And I, I, think, I think as well, the, the thing I have actually noticed recently is that even in 2021, as we've started, is that the, the mental health issues that have arisen in our community are higher than any point of my time doing ministry. And for us as a church, we, we care deeply, not just about your soul, but your mind as well. We think that Jesus is in the business of renewing our minds. And so for us, we are investing in that. So in 2020, we were able to bring on somebody who goes to church here. Um, we were able to bring on them as a, as a partnership and to allow her to begin offering counseling services to our church at a very discounted rate. We're grateful for that. And our intentions and our plans is to be able to grow and expand that as we move forward to make a difference in people's lives. How many of you guys are grateful for that as well? Amen. And honestly, I, I could spend the next three hours telling of all the good things and individual stories of what God has done. And part of what we've done to be able to um, make it so you don't have to listen to me for three hours is we have actually put together a guide. And this is our annual report. And it tells, it celebrates what God has done and looks forward to our future in Him. We're going to invite you to take a look at that in, in just a couple of minutes, but I really would encourage you to do so because God is at work. He is real. And when we ask this question, is the church headed on a trajectory like Blockbuster? The answer is no. The gates of hell will not prevail. The church is still alive. The church is still active. The church is a place where we contend for one another. The church is a place where we encourage each other's hearts. The church is a place where we are united in love. The church is a place we are rooted in what is good and what is true. And his name is Jesus. If you believe it, would you say amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for the vision of this church, that you have blessed us with each other with an amazing community, a safe place to grow our faith, to find friendships, real authentic friendships. And Lord, that's been hard this year. So Lord, I, I pray you would encourage our hearts. We need you, Jesus. We need you more than ever. And man, this year has really shown us that. So Lord, today we declare together as one church, unified in love on your name, that we are yours. We, we don't hold tightly to anything but you, Lord. We want you, Jesus. In fact, we're so grateful, Lord, for all the faithfulness you have had in the past. And so we look forward to your future. We want what you want, Jesus. If you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. Would you stand? Let's respond and worship together.